Thank you. No problem. All right, great. Well, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, thanks for joining me today for our webinar today on creating Power BI solutions with the new Power BI desktop. So uh, again, if you're new to Power BI, uh, we're, we're looking at a lot of the new things that just came out uh, a little bit more than a week ago on uh, July 24th. Uh, we had the Power BI desktop was released as well as the Power BI uh, service, which is powerbi.com. And we're going to be looking specifically at the desktop tool for this, but I will point out to you some things that you'll uh, be interested in with the service as well as the powerbi.com. Uh, there were some questions as far as looking for an on-prem solution. Uh, there are some things that you can do. There's uh, like uh, Data Zen, for example, is the on-prem solution as far as visualizing dashboards and things like that. There's also some other solutions that you can do even within Power BI to address uh, connecting to on-prem data sources uh, we're we're going to lightly answer those through some questions. I don't have any demos prepared for that, not at least for this one. That might be a future webinar that we do, but um, uh, you can check that out. And again, I, I am doing, I have about 17 people now in here and a little Periscope session that we're doing. If you're interested in checking that out, it's a little social media thing, a new new type of social media that's been around for a couple, I guess several months now. But it's um, it's a way of you can actually see behind the scenes. I'm looking at a camera right now. They can see me. And uh, if you go to my Twitter, which you see on my screen right now, if you're in the webinar, you can follow along with that as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And I want to start by talking about, first of all, what are we going to look at today? And uh, you can see here on my screen, hopefully you guys are in the webinar if you're on the social media source here. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. I'm skipping that part, uh, least important of the things to talk about here. But a little bit about myself. I am the training director here at Pragmatic Works. Uh, so any kind of training offerings that we do, things like streaming training that we're offering, as well as workshops and uh, webinars, all that stuff usually goes through me in some, some way. Uh, I also am a SQL Server MVP, and I've written a couple books. So I've written a couple books. You can find them on, on Amazon. They're usually all data-related in some way, uh, where I'll have things like on visualizing data or creating BI solutions. I have several books out there that you can catch. Uh, I also run, run a local user group here in Jacksonville. It's actually what I'm, I'm wearing on my shirt right now is our local SQL Saturday that we did. And uh, we're going to do another one of those uh, coming up next year, about May or April. But I run that local group here in Jacksonville. I also blog at a website called DevonKnightSQL.com. So you can visit my blog and I write quite a bit about Power BI, as well as some of my other cohorts here at uh, Pragmatic Works uh, do as well. All right. So... Uh, oh, by the way, my email is on the screen there as well. It's dknight at pragmaticworks.com if you want to reach out to me after, afterwards as well. So our plan for today looks like this. We're first going to talk briefly about what is the Power BI desktop? Why do you have this new tool? What's the point of another tool to be able to do Power BI? We want to spend a little bit of time doing some level setting there in case you've never heard of the Power BI desktop, that you'll now be familiar at least what the tool is. It's a, it's a fairly new release. It's a new tool. Uh, but I want to give you some some back set on why they came out with this new tool and what's the what's the deal with it. I also want to bring up what's new in the Power BI desktop because there's some things that you can do in the Power BI desktop that aren't available in tools like Excel. So if you're using Excel right now to do Power BI through things like Power Pivot, Power Query, Power View, there's some things that you can't do inside of Excel that you can now do inside of Power BI in the Power BI desktop. So I want to point out some of those things and make sure it's real obvious. What are some of the new features that you're getting through the Power BI desktop? I also want to talk about what's not there yet. And I want to emphasize yet because a lot of the things that you can do inside of Excel are going to be migrated into the Power BI desktop. It's just not there yet. The tool just uh, GA was general available, made general available uh, on the 24th. So there's a lot of things that are going to be coming with it as time goes on. In fact, they have monthly release cycles. So you'll have a new release or new update to Power BI Desktop, basically monthly, uh, with new features and new enhancements that are coming with it. So you can expect new and more things to come. If it's not there yet, then it's likely to come later. So don't, don't uh, be too down on yourself if you don't see something there yet. All right, great. So let's uh, get into what, first of all, what is the Power BI Desktop? So the Power BI Desktop is a free application. It's completely free. Uh, the desktop application, as it sounds, is a desktop application. You would download it on your device. Uh, I get this question a lot. Can you do it on Macs? No, there's not a Mac version of it yet, but you can certainly do some uh, Power BI development from the web, from PowerBI.com for my Mac users. But the Power BI Desktop is a Windows application that allows you to develop Power BI solutions, and it's a combination of tools. It's a combination of Power Query, which is a data extraction tool, 
It's a combination of then Power Pivot, which is like a data modeling tool, and as well Power View, which is a data visualization tool. So it takes these three tools, brings them together as one inside of its standalone tool. And the great thing about it being in the standalone tool is it actually removes a lot of barriers that some people have for Power BI. So for some people, they couldn't do Power BI because they didn't have a certain version of Excel or Office. So just so you know, some limitations as far as doing Power BI in Excel is, first of all, if you want to do things like Power Pivot, you have to have Office Professional Plus. And not everybody has Professional Plus. So uh, using a tool like the Power BI Desktop, it doesn't have any special licensing to it. It's absolutely free, and you can download it and use it at your will. You don't have to have a certain version. Uh, there's also no um, certain releases that you have to have as far as Office 365. So if you've used Office 365 before in the past, it's like a cloud version or a service version, um, a subscription verb is the version is what I mean, a subscription version of Office, and uh, that gave you most up-to-date versions of your Office. Now, you don't have to have any of that for Power BI Desktop. That's the great news as you are, uh, any roadblocks that you might have had should be eliminated now with Power BI Desktop. And for a lot of people, they actually would experience, you know, some minor instabilities with Power BI in Excel. And I can tell you from experience, the Power BI desktop tool is very stable. There's a 32-bit, there's a 64-bit version of the tool. Uh, you can even have a 32-bit version of Excel on your machine and have a 64-bit version, 64 version of desktop on your machine at the same time. So there's some, there's some nice things that you can do by having this as a separate tool for doing Power BI. And uh, I want to actually go into some of the details of it here now. But again, the whole purpose of having the separate tool, it eliminates the uh, barriers that a lot of people had to doing Power BI. It also makes it so that the Power BI team can release things a lot quicker. They're not reliant on the Excel team as much. They can actually have new releases monthly, like I have uh, on the slide here, rather than having to wait um, you know, years or whenever they do their office updates. So it, it relieves a lot of that for them. All right, so let's talk about some of the specifics here. So I mentioned that Power BI includes three tools, Power Query, Power Pivot, and Power View. Let's look at each of those tools. We're going to talk about what are some of the new things that you're getting in the Power BI desktop that you don't have in Excel already. And uh, let's talk about what are some of the things that aren't there yet, okay? Just so you're aware of them, I have a feeling that a lot of these features will be there eventually, um, but they're not there yet. So Power Query, again, is a data extraction tool. So this is going to be your primary tool for getting data. And, and, and Power BI Desktop, it's your only way of getting data. You're going to go use inside of the Power BI Desktop, and you may also do this inside of Excel, the Power Query add-in, to be able to import data or extract data and bring it into your Power BI solution and eventually into a data model. So you have a couple of new things in the Power BI Desktop. Some of the new things that you didn't have available before are new data sources. There's actually a lot of new data sources that are still currently in beta that you will find inside of the Power BI Desktop. And I'll show you a few of those here in a few moments. A lot of those are SaaS providers, so software as a service providers. If you have things like Twilio or um, I'm trying to think, uh, there's a few other ones on there that we'll look at here in a few moments. You can have a connection to those data sources inside of your Power BI Desktop. You can already do that from PowerBI.com. You also have some new transformations available to you, and a lot of these transformations were already there. They just made them a little bit more obvious in the user interface. So things like there's some new extract features. There's also some new join types that are available as well. Uh, again, a lot of those join types you could already do, but they've now made the UI a lot easier for you to do them. Uh, and so what's missing? So here there's some things that aren't there yet. For example, there's things like the data catalog search. So if you're a, an Excel user right now, if you're living and breathing inside of Excel and you have downloaded the Power Query add-in before, then you'll note that there is a data catalog search which allows you to go search for organization queries or public queries that have been published and curated by yourself or by Microsoft for that matter. Uh, that's not available inside the Power BI desktop yet. Uh, in addition to that, there's no macro integration. So obviously you're not inside of Excel anymore. So there's no macros that you can use to kind of enhance and do further things inside of Power Query. So let me show you, before I jump into the desktop tool here, I actually want to briefly bring up that macro integration thing that I mentioned here. A lot of people don't realize that there is some integration into the macros that are used inside of Power BI and for Excel. So what I'm telling you in this slide is that you no longer have that integration for the Power BI desktop, but I want to briefly show you what are some of the things you could do uh, very briefly. Uh, in fact, I have an, an example that's already built out here. And basically this quick little example, all this is showing you, and I, I believe I've shown this in a previous webinar as well on Power Query, 
But all this webinar, all this uh, workbook is showing is that you can integrate into the macros into Excel and be able to do things like refresh Power Query queries. So for example, you'll see I have this query here that has 218 rows brought in right here. This is called Employee Final Results. Right now I have a little macro here that's uh, driven by a button and I can click on that button and it refresh the query for me. So for example, let me show you what I mean by that. If I adjust the dates inside this table, let's say I change that to 2002 instead of 2003, hit refresh on my query, you'll now see that my results bring back 18 rows instead of 200 and something rows. So that integration into the macros you won't have in the Power BI desktop because you're in a different application. There's not that quite integration like you have here. You can't do things like Excel tables that integrate directly in and you can modify and have them linked like you see here as well. Uh, the other piece I mentioned that's missing is the data catalog search. That's the one right here. The data catalog search allows you to either search organization queries, queries that I've published to my organization, or I can also search out public queries that others have uh, our, our Microsoft is kind of curated through uh, data sources like data.gov, World Bank, World, uh, World Health Organization, things like that. I can search for those queries in the data catalog search. That's available in Excel. It's not on the Power BI desktop application yet. All right, let's actually look at the Power BI desktop. I'm going to go ahead and launch the tool here. I have it right here available. And so what I want to show you is an example of using Power Query in the Power BI desktop. Okay, let me go ahead and launch it. It's thinking about launching on my other screen here. Give me one moment. And so what I'm going to do as we launch this is, you can see it launching here now, is I'm going to go pull in data from a data source that I have on the web. Okay, so I have a web data source here. And basically what I want to show you in this data source is it has all sorts of data that's coming from the census. Okay, so it's U.S. Census data. So I'm going to go to this website that I have this data source. It's uh, called Quick Facts. Census.gov. Okay, and there's a couple different data sources in here that I want to bring together. And my ultimate goal here is to show you some of the new Power BI desktop things that you can do that you can't do in Excel yet. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the US Quick Facts. And this is just a website here. And I'll find as I scroll down here that the full data sets are a little bit further towards the bottom. I'm going to go ahead and go to that. And there's these three data sets at the top here. There's one that has each of the counties. There's ones that has a data dictionary and one that really just has all the metrics in it. And so I'm going to take this data. I'm going to start with, uh, let's say, the county here, for example. And the cool thing, if you haven't played with Power Query before, the cool thing about Power Query is I don't have to actually download these, these text files here. I can actually point to the text files that exist on the web and pull that data into Excel, so, or in this case, into Power, Query, Power BI Desktop. So to do that, I can simply right click on this link to where the file's at and tell it that I just want to copy the shortcut, bring that into my Power BI desktop that I have over here. Let me bring the whole thing over here eventually. And I'm going to tell it that I want to go get data. Now, what you're seeing here in the Power BI desktop, this is the getting started experience. And in the getting started experience, what you're seeing is any recent files that I've used, any recent files that I've built. You're also seeing several videos here that will help you and guide you through building out solutions. So if you're new to this, you can launch any of these videos. It'll give you a quick tutorial on how to use this tool. But generally what you're going to do is you're going to start with the get data section here. So I'm going to tell it I want to go get the data. I'll select get data here. It's going to launch open on my other screen. Let me pull back over here. It's going to launch open this section here where I can select where the data is that I want to pull from. So I can find that underneath the other section here, I have data that I can pull in from the web. There's plenty of other data sources that you can pull from, including some of the ones I mentioned that were in beta still. So you'll see here things like uh, QuickBooks Online, Zendesk, GitHub. Those can all be used here as data sources as well. They're currently in beta, but those are SaaS providers that you can use as uh, connections. We're going to pull in data from the web here. So I'm going to select web and hit connect. And it's pulling my Power BI desktop over on my other screen here. I'm going to pull that over here eventually. Let me actually do that now. There we go. This is the Power BI desktop. And again, I'm going to get data from the web. Okay. And I'm going to plug in the URL that I just copied. You'll see here. Okay. So those of you in the webinar see this. I'm just kind of talking to my phone here. I'll hit OK. It's going to pull that data in from that county name file. And I'm going to start to manipulate it a bit. And I'm going to show you some of the new things that are in Power Query. There's just a few, but I want to show those to you in here. And maybe there's some things I'll show you that have been here you just didn't know you could do yet. 
Uh, now, if I wanted to take this data and bring it directly into Power BI and bring it into a data model, I would immediately hit load, and that would pull that into a Power Pivot data model. In my case, though, I'd like to hit edit so I can actually start to modify some of the data as I pull it in. So I'll click edit here. And as I select edit, this is going to launch the query editor, which is also known as Power Query. So we're looking at Power Query here. These are This is the data that I just pulled in from that website. And I can now tell it, how do I want to actually manip, uh, manipulate this data? So for example, a couple things that I want to do is I want to pull in and have a separate column for states. Right now I see county and state merged together as a single column. I want to have a special column for state. And I also want to be able to filter down some of this data because as you look at it here, you'll see that it's a little kind of convoluted because I have in here the United States, I have the actual state name, and then I have all the counties listed below it. So I want to be able to manipulate this file in some way to be able to fix what we're looking at here. And the way I'll do that is first I'm going to start by splitting this column that I have here called column two. I'm going to split this into two separate columns based on the look, what looks like a comma delimiter that I have here. So to do that, I can either right click or go up to the transform tab at the very top and select split column. I'll split by a delimiter and I'll tell it that the delimiter I want to split on is going to be a column comma delimiter. And I only really have one comma, so it doesn't matter what I select here, but I'll do leftmost just to be certain I only do it one time. I'll hit OK. It's now going to split those into two separate columns here. And then now I can start to manipulate this a little bit more. You can see that appears here as two separate columns. And uh, let's say, what else, what else do I want to do in here? Maybe I want to filter out the United States. I see there's this United States column here. Let's our value. Let's get rid of United States. I can just do a simple filter by coming up to the top here, type in the United States, and filter that out if I don't want to see United States. So that'll filter out that first value there. So now I'm just seeing the states and the counties. Now, let's say we want to be a little bit more advanced here. And rather than seeing the state abbreviation, I actually want to see the full state name. Now, right now, unfortunately, it looks like the state name only appears in the same row as the county or the, the same column as the county. So what I'd like to do is I want to get the values that have the state in it, and I'm going to bring it over as an, its own column, and then we're going to replicate that value all the way down. Let me show you what I mean by that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by creating a new custom column. So to create a new column, we'll go up to Add Column and select Add Custom Column. And we're going to use a little bit of M. M is the query language that's used for Power Query. So if you're new to Power Query, it has a language behind the scenes that does all this data transformation for us. Uh, you don't necessarily have to learn it in depth. You can certainly, if you want to do more advanced things, you'll want to learn it. But most of what the user interface can do, it'll, it'll solve 90% of your problems just by using the user interface. But when there's things that you want to go a little bit more advanced, like in this case where I want to create a new custom column, I might write a little bit of M. So I'm going to do a little if statement here, and I'll say if the column, which is called column 2.2, .2, if column 2.2 .2 is null, then I want to replace it with column 2.1, else null. Okay, now again, a couple things you should know about the mQuery language. It is case sensitive, okay? So there are some things you need to be aware of. For example, if I did something like a capital I here, you'll notice here that it's giving me an error because the if statement here is case sensitive. It needs to be a lowercase i to actually uh, parse correctly. So be careful with some of those things. It is case sensitive. All right, so I've got a new column here. I'm going to go ahead and call this new column state, okay, and hit OK. But basically what I'm doing is I'm saying if this value is null, then bring back the column uh, Alabama here, the value Alabama across. Else, don't bring anything. That's my else here. Else, do null, nothing. All right, so I'll hit OK. I can now see that I have a new column here that has Alabama, and as I scroll down, I'll see uh, eventually Alaska up here and Arizona up here as a new value inside this new column. Now, the reason why I'm doing this, I'm setting this up. I'm setting the stage for something that we want to do here because what I'm going to do next is I want to see the full state name by selecting that column, and I want to see the state name all the way down for every row that we have here. So I'm going to go up to Transform, and you'll see there's an option here called Fill, and I'm going to do a fill down. You could also do a fill up, but a fill down is going to take that value and replicate it all the way down until there's something to replace it with. So if I select fill down, notice what happens here. Alabama is now replicated all the way down. I can scroll down. I'll notice as it goes to the next state that it then converts over to Alaska, and it does Alaska all the way down until it gets to Arizona. 
All right, so we're kind of building up this new field here. In fact, I like that new field so much that I'm eventually going to get rid of this column 2.2. But before I do that, I want to filter out this row that has the state in it. So if I want to filter out the rows that have states in it, you'll see that there's a null value here on the state abbreviation. So I'll do a little filter on that, tell it that I want to get rid of all the null values. So I'll get rid of nulls, hit OK. And now I just have the county, the state abbreviation, the full state name. Now, if I don't really care for the abbreviation, I could outright delete it if I wanted to. You can right-click on a column, tell it you want to remove it, and we're looking pretty good. You could also do some other types of transforms. For example, if I wanted to modify the text here of state and have it be capital A for Alabama and lowercase everything else, I could do that as well by selecting the uh, state name here. And underneath the transform tab, you'll find underneath the... Uh, format section here, there's a capitalize each word transform that will actually capitalize do uh, each first word will have a, uh, each word will be capitalized. So I'll select that. That'll capitalize each word for me. looks pretty good. I'm going to do one other thing here just to help me a little bit later. I'm going to delete this change type because the first column had a change data type. There's a leading zero in those columns that it removed. I'm going to go ahead and delete that step out and you'll see that the leading zero is now there again. All right. Uh, one last thing I think I need to do just for, um, making sure everything works together. I'm going to trim out any kind of trailing spaces I might have here. And then let's rename these columns. This is a, a kind of a code called FIPS. This is going to be the county. Just renaming the columns now. And then this is state I've already renamed. We'll call this my county query or just county. And then let's actually pull in some other one data here. So I have some other data that we can pull in. Let's go back here. Let's pull in this time. Uh, let's go get the data dictionary here. So I'm going to right click on the data dictionary, copy the link address for that, go back over here to Power Query. I'm going to create another new query here, and you can stay inside the query editor to do this by going to Home, and you can select that you want to do a new source. So I'll select New Source here, and select that I want to pull in from the web again, paste in the URL just like we did last time. Okay. All right, so we've got that pulled in now, this new data source. You'll see this new data source is pretty nasty, just about as nasty, uh, worse than the last one, actually. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that what we see here in this new data source. We're going to manipulate it a bit to get what we want out of it, and then we'll kind of align it with all the other data sources that we're going to pull together here. I will go ahead and rename this one. This is called my data dictionary, so let me go ahead and rename that, data dictionary. Okay, and then let's start to manipulate this data some. So I see here uh, that I have all the data really mushed into a single row. So I'm going to split this into multiple columns. So if I want to split this into multiple columns, I can either right click on the column and say that I want to do uh, split column right here, and I can split on a delimiter. In my case, it's going to be based on a number of characters because it's kind of like a, uh, a fixed width file that I have here. So I'm going to do by number of characters. Okay. I'll then tell that I want to split on a certain number of characters. Like, let's say I want to say, give me, give me a break in my column at nine characters in. And I want to do that at the leftmost area. I'll hit OK. OK, so that gives me my first column here. I can do another split columns. And I happen to already know the number of characters here, so I'm not guessing. I actually know that 88 characters in will get me my last column here. OK, so I can see I have two columns in here. One that has the actual code for what the data is going to look like. And then one that also shows in here the actual description on the code. So let me go ahead and remove this last column. I don't care about so much for that one, but I do need these two. And i uh, tell you what, I want to also take this first row. That's really my column headers. So I'll take that first row and I'll push it up to the header section by going underneath the uh, use first row as headers option right here. So I can do that use first row as headers, select that. That pushes up that column up into the first uh, header row or the header section. And if I want, I can even rename them even further. I can say, well, really, I just want to call this description. And I just want to call this one, uh, let's call this my metric code, or let's call it metric. That's fine. All right. Cool. So I now have two data sources in. I'm going to also trim these as well, just to make sure there's no trailing spaces before or after the characters. I can right-click on them. You can do multiple columns at once. You can see I multi-selected those. And I can do a transform to trim those out. All right. So... We've got a couple things here. There's one more data source I want to pull in that I'm going to do pretty quickly because I want to get to showing you the new stuff here, but I had to get some data in here to get started. So bear with me. I'm going to do this last one here a little faster. This last one's going to have the actual metric data that I want to analyze. So I'm going to take this one. I'm going to bring this one in from the web again, paste the URL in. This one actually has the data set where the, the metrics, data, metrics are. So I'm going to pull this data in, and the things that I want to do on this one 
are, uh, first of all, we're going to do some unpivoting of the data. We're going to rename some columns. There's some other things that we're going to want to do in here. Uh, I'm going to undo this change data type that it did on this first column. I just killed the step and it removed that change type. And I want to unpivot these other fields that you have because these are the metrics. You'll recognize these codes from the last data set. The last data set or the last query we had had the data dictionary. And I want to translate these codes into an actual description. So I'm going to unpivot all of these columns that I see here, except for the FIPS code, which is just kind of a, a code that the government uses for identifying counties here. So I'm going to right click on FIPS and I'm going to tell it that I want to unpivot other columns right here. And that will unpivot all the other ones that I don't have selected. All right. So you can see here it's done that for me. So I'm going to call this my metric. And I'll, uh, I can leave this as value if I want. I can leave it to do whatever I want with that. But I'm, I am going to go ahead and change the data type of this one. It's not going to be text. I want it to be a decimal value of some kind here. All right, great. So we've got the data pretty much set to go here. I'm going to make sure that I don't have any trailing spaces on this again, just because it was a file. So I'm going to do a little trim on this as well, like we did last time. And my data is starting to look pretty good. So I can actually take what I have here so far and start to merge these different data sources together. So this was my one that actually had my metrics in it. Okay, and then now if I want to start to merge these different data sets together, I can really pick whichever one of these I want. So if I want to start with the county one and merge other things in with county, or if I want to start with the data dictionary and merge other things with that, if I can, I can do that as well. I'll start with the county one that we had originally started with, and I'm going to merge in other queries that we've just created. So you'll see up here in the top this merge query section where I can merge in and basically do a join. If you've done SQL joins, it's like SQL joins here. I'll select merge queries. Now, the new thing, this is new to Power BI Desktop that I'm sure you'll see inside of Excel soon, is that I can now merge in using different types of joins. If you've used Power Query before in the past, the user interface only supported inner joins and like left outer joins. Uh, you could do other types of joins if you knew mQuery. You could go write your own. But now here inside the Power BI Desktop, you'll see here in the bottom, it does support other types of joins. So you do have a left outer join, a right outer join, a full outer join, an inner join. You have a left anti-join and a right anti-join. So I know, I'm sure most of you know what the first four are. Let me talk about what the uh, last two are. The last two are the left anti-join means that it's going to only return rows that exist exclusively in the first table. Okay. So what I mean by that is you can see my county table up at the top. If I were to tell it that I want to pull in another data set, let's say the uh, metrics one here. If I were to do a left anti-join, that means that would only return back rows that only existed in the first data set, this one on the top. It, if, it, if it had any ones in the other data set, my metrics one, they would not return back. So it's a kind of interesting join there. What I would probably do here is more of an inner join, which says only return back rows where they exist in both data sets or both queries. So if I wanted to do an inner join here, I would select my join column or columns. You can actually join on multiple columns here. In this case, I only have one column. It's the FIPS column here, and the FIPS column here make up my join. Okay, So I'll select those two and hit OK, and it's now going to create a join between those two different data sets. You can see it's brought in a new column here, and I can actually expand that and bring back my metrics data here from my other data set. So you can now see the metrics also showing here at the same time with the county data. So we've now merged two queries together. Let's merge one more query together. We're going to go back to merge queries. And we're going to select on the bottom. We're going to pick that we want to bring back the data dictionary this time. The data dictionary is going to join on the metrics column and the metrics column here. And I'll do an inner join again. Okay, but again, you could choose one of the other types of joins. That's fine. But you'll notice here in the bottom that they match exactly anyways as far as the number of rows. All right, great. So I'll select that. That's now going to merge in my third query together. And you'll see that appear here. Now, I think I saw a question pop up in the chat here in the GoToMeeting. The uh, question was around the, not, the amount of data that can be handled inside of Power Query. Now, what you're looking at right now, if you notice in the bottom left, you're looking at a subset of the data. It's not going to return back the full data set inside of Power Query. Basically, it gives you a, a sampling of the data to apply any kind of transforms or data manipulation to it. And then whenever you're happy with the final query, you can hit close and load, and then it will apply that entire query against the entire data set. So it will eventually apply it against the entire data set here. All right, so I'll hit OK. I'll pull in the description. OK, so I can now see all the columns that I'm going to need for the result here. And I can now hit close and load. 
Now, there are a few other things I'll point out that are new inside the Power BI desktop as far as Power Query. For the most part, everything here is the same as it is in Excel, except for the merge queries I showed you, which I'm sure will be in Excel eventually. And then you'll also see here underneath the Transform tab, you also have this new section here called Extract, where you can tell it that I want to bring back the first eight characters or the last 10 characters, things like that. So those are some new things that you're seeing in here that I'm sure will be in Excel as well. All right, so I'm going to go to Home, and I'm going to hit Close and Load to take this data and now bring it into Power BI. Now, what it's doing here when I hit Close and Load is it's taking this data, and it's actually bringing it into Power Pivot, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. And Power Pivot, what it's going to do is bring that data into this proprietary in-memory technology. Okay, so you'll see it's creating and it's bringing it into the data model. Now, if you notice it's not moving, it's because I'm zoomed in and I froze my screen because I wanted you to see this but it's actually pulling that data in and it attempts to detect relationships that may exist between the different tables that you have. In my case, I don't actually need all those tables because remember I merged everything into the one single county query, but if I wanted to have multiple queries and actually create the relationships inside of Power Pivot, you could do that as well. So um, you're looking at right now, we are inside of Power View and you'll notice there's three different sections here on the right hand side. The bottom two, this one and this one are related to Power Pivot. If you've done Power Pivot in Excel, this is like your data tab, and this is like your diagram tab. So this is looking at Power Pivot and allowing you to see uh, a diagram view of your model or actually a data view of your model, and you can create calculations there. Uh, you can also, I think there's a lot of investment that they're doing there now, and there'll be more that's added later because there's some things that you can't do in Power Pivot yet for Power, uh, Power BI Desktop. So you'll, you'll see a lot more investment in those over time, I think. But uh, right now, those two icons that I'm pointing to are the data view and the diagram view that you might be very familiar with inside of Excel already. Not fully functional like they are in Excel yet, but it's, it's getting there. The other uh, icon that I have here is Power View. The report tab here is where you can actually start to build different visualizations on it. Uh, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Power Pivot, and I'm going to go back to the slides for that for just a moment. Okay, great. So inside of Power Pivot, there's a couple of new things that you need to be aware of that are now available inside the Power BI desktop. So new things, and I'm looking at my slides here now, the new things you can now do are some new DAX functions. You have some new functions that are more for uh, an more analytical people at heart. There's things like percentile and some new, new different uh, functions. There's also things like date diff that a lot of people were really looking forward to. There's also some new functionality in DAX for variables. So there's some variable capabilities now inside of DAX that allow you to really compartmentalize a lot of your code and make it a lot easier to read. That's why most people are doing variables here now is a, it's a lot easier to read your code when you place portions of it in variables. I'll show you an example of that. Power Pivot can also support many-to-many -many relationships inside of the Power BI desktop, which it cannot do very well inside of Excel. You have to write quite a bit of DAX to make that work inside of Excel, whereas in the desktop tool, it just works. It works, and there's some nice capabilities in there where you can tell it um, what, dire what direction the relationship should work in, and we're going to take a look at that. Now, some of the things that aren't there yet, some of the things that don't exist in the Power BI desktop, but I'm sure they're coming, things like hierarchies. There are no hierarchies in the Power BI desktop. Uh, there's no KPIs. You can't do KPIs in the Power BI desktop. Um, there is some image support, but not complete image support. So for example, what I mean by that, you can have an image in a URL. So if you have a URL of an image that you have in your model, you can use that. But if the URL, if the image is actually in the data itself, if it's like a binary data type that's storing the image, it doesn't support that yet. Uh, there's some other things like little, little nice add-ins that you could do inside of Excel that aren't there. Things like deciding what, how, how a field is going to aggregate. For example, if you have a column inside of a date table called year, well, year is going to aggregate because it's a number. It's going to assume you want to summarize year. Uh, well, often you don't want to summarize year, and you want to make sure that never happens. And uh, inside of Excel, you can turn it off. You can tell it, I never want to summarize this field. But inside of Power BI Desktop, that capability is not there yet. You have to more do it inside of the reporting layer itself. There's also some other things that you could do, things like default fields exist inside of Excel. The point being, there's some things that aren't there yet, but they're coming. They're coming. There, there's not full feature parity with what Power Pivot can do, but there's a lot of stuff that'll be there. As I said, Power, Power BI Desktop is going to have like a monthly iteration of releases, so you can expect a lot of these things to come. All right, so let's look at uh, the Power Pivot capabilities here. And uh, I mentioned a couple things specifically that I wanted to show you here, and I'm going to do that by opening up an existing model that I already have here. Let me do that real quickly, and I'm going to pull it over so you can see 
because this other model has a little bit more interesting um, things in it that I want to show you. So let me pull this one over. Here you go. All right. So this is, uh, again, the Power BI desktop against another data source that I've already pulled in. And what I want to show you in here is some capabilities that you cannot do inside of Excel that are inside the desktop application right now, the Power BI desktop. The one that we're looking at right now is an example of a many-to-many -many relationship. So let me show you the diagram view of this real quick so you get an idea of what I'm trying to show you. Uh, so in this diagram, if you take a look at this, okay, inside this diagram, you're seeing a many-to-many -many relationship here. And what we're, our many-to-many -many is related on is the reason why someone buys something. So there's multiple reasons why someone might buy something. I might like to buy your product because not only is it on sale, but it also has the highest quality. So if, those, if you have multiple reasons why you buy something and you want to log each of those entries, then you might have a good case for a many-to-many. -many. Another good case for a many-to-many -many is, uh, let's say you work for a call center and someone calls in for a certain uh, need, but then you end up uh, upselling them on something else. That's, that's a good case for a many-to-many -many because there might be multiple reasons for the call. So in this case, there's a similar scenario. Someone bought a product. Here's the actual sale of the product. And I have this bridge table right here, which is defining the many to many. It has a bridge between the actual sale of the product and the reason why someone bought it. Because again, you can have multiple reasons why someone bought something. So this bridge table is merging that in as, it's also known as a factless fact table if you, if you go deep in a uh, dimensional modeling. But it's a, it's a relationship table basically that, that stores the relationship between the reason why someone bought something and the actual purchase itself in this case. All right. So, Again, inside of Excel, you could do this, but you had to write some kind of nasty DAX to make it work. You no longer have to write that nasty DAX inside of Power BI Desktop because here's your solution now. By the way, this is the diagram view that you're looking at. Uh, you can notice over here on the right, the left hand side, excuse me, this is the diagram view. If you want to look at the data view, you can select the data view here. It will show you that as well. So this is a data view and you can kind of go back and forth between the tables on the right hand side. Looks pretty similar to Excel. It's not completely like Excel, but it's getting there. All right. So let's show you exactly what we just did. You can see here right now the many to many is not working because here's the reasons why people buy things. And here's the act some metric that I have from my sales table. And unfortunately, the sales are duplicating. I kind of have this Cartesian product of all the sales that I have for the entire model because it doesn't understand how to navigate that many-to-many -many relationship by default. But what you can do inside of the Power BI desktop is you can go up to the section here where you can manage relationships. And if I go up to manage relationships here, I can find the relationship that's defining my many-to-many, -many, which is between my fact internet sales reason and my fact internet sales. And I can do a special advanced edit of this relationship. So I can click edit here on the bottom. And when I select edit, you'll see that you can define which column the relationship's based off of. Or you can go a step further down here at the bottom where it says advanced options, and you can define this as a many-to-many. -many. So if I go down here, you'll, you can see here the cardinality, but really the cardinality isn't something I want to change. It's more the direction. So the direction of the cross filter that we're using, right now it has a single, meaning that it can only go one way. But if we wanted to have bidirectional relationship, you can change that from single to both. And if I select both and hit OK, that's not the default, by the way. You have to go in and make that change. If I hit OK on that and hit close, I can now have, and you'll see here this will refresh in a second, and my many-to-many -many relationship will now work correctly. There we go. So it automatically refreshed on its own after I modify that relationship, and you can see that relationship showing up here in the visualization side. This is inside of Power View. Okay? So that's one aspect of this. Let's, uh, let's show you some other new Power Pivot stuff. The other new Power Pivot stuff has to do with creating calculations and, and creating calculated columns and created, ca creating calculated measures. I'm going to show you this through a calculated measure that we're going to create together. The calculated measure that we're going to do together is going to be that I want to calculate out what, uh, let's say, profit margin is. So I want to calculate based off of some values that I already have inside of my Internet sales table over here. So I have my sales table. And inside my sales table, I can see the fields in here called sales amount. And I also have one in here called total product cost a little further down. And so what I'd like to do is I want to create a new calculation that not only calculates profit, but maybe eventually gets me profit margin. So I can do that by right clicking on uh, really anywhere, but I'll right click on the table and I'll tell it that I want to create a new measure. Okay. So let me make that a little wider there. 
I'll right click and select new measure. And it's gonna bring this up into a formula bar for me. So there's no formula bar here yet, but as soon as I click that, you'll see the formula bar appear here. And I'm gonna minimize some of these things while we're working on this. Okay, let me try that one more time. I have a couple things open guys. So if it's uh, acts a little slow, that's probably because I have a couple uh, desktop apps up here. All right, cool. So I've got a new calculation here. And if I want to create this new calculation, I can come up here and I can name it. First of all, let's call this one profit uh, margin. OK, so I'll call it profit margin. And you're going to start with an equal sign. Very similar to what you would do inside of Excel. And uh, I want to start by showing you how you can actually do some new things here that don't exist inside of Excel. One of those things is you can now do comments. So if you've done comments in other coding languages before, basically it's just a way of documenting your code. So uh, for example, I want to eventually show you some variables in here. So if I want to document that, I can put something like forward slash forward slash, that's, that's comment here. And I can tell it that uh, I am going to document that I'm about to declare a variable. Or how about declare the variables. So you can actually do some documentation in here using forward slashes like this. And that's a way of commenting out code. When you see it in green, that means it's commented out. If you do a shift enter, that'll allow you to go to the next return, the next line, and you can actually start to have multi-line code here as well. So for example, what I'd like to do here is I'm going to have a variable, and to identify a variable here, you'll type VAR, that's declaring a variable, and I'm going to call this variable something like uh, sales. Okay, so I'll, I'll create a variable called sales, and I'll set that variable equal to the value of, let's say, sum of the sales amount. Okay, so very simple so far. I declared a variable, I called it sales, and I set it equal to the sum of sales. You can have multiple variables. So if I wanted to have another variable, I can do shift enter again to go down to the next line, and I can declare another variable here, and I'll make this variable, let's call this one cost, and I'll set this one equal to the value of the sum of the total product cost, I believe in here. Yeah, there it is. And so I now have two variables, one called sales, one called cost. I'm doing it on multi-lines just so you guys can read it a little bit better, but you don't have to do it on multi-lines if you don't want to. Let's show you, though, hey, I can create a third variable that references the other variables. So I'm going to create a third variable here. I'll call this one profit, okay, and I'll set this one equal to sales minus cost. And you'll notice when you do that that the IntelliSense actually gives you a little indicator here showing you that that is a variable there. So I now have three variables. I eventually created a variable that's called profit. Again, the whole point of the variable is to really compartmentalize a lot of this code so it's a lot easier to read because here's what I can do next is I can go down to the next line. Let's, um, let's say that I want to, in the comments, say I'm going to return the calculation results. So I'll say inter return calc results, and then the return is going to look like this. You'll actually say return, okay? And then I'll do a little function here where I'm going to do, I want to return back profit margin. So I'm going to do a divide function. You could also just do simple division signs. The reason I like the divide function, that's been around for a bit, but it'll handle division by zero for you there nicely. And I'm going to tell it that I want to divide profit by uh, sales. Okay, so divide profit by sales. That should get me profit margin, which is what I called the calculation way up here. But that's basically what you're doing. You can declare the variables, and then when you want to actually return something, you type return, and anything after the return is what it's going to return back for you. So I did a little basic function here, dividing profit by sales. And one mistake I have here is you don't need a division sign. You actually need a comma when you're using the divide function. All right, cool. So I'll hit enter on that. That's going to create a new calculation for me here. You'll notice the calculations in the field list over here on the right-hand side. This is a calculation. You can see the little calculator icon next to it. All of the other ones that you see in here, this is a calculated field, by the way, that I created previously. And you'll also see any of these ones that have the little sigma symbol next to it. Those are called implicit measures. They're going to summarize by default, and that might not be what you want them to do. So, for, for example, I gave the example earlier. Maybe you have a year column that has the little sigma symbol next to it because it's a number. It's going to automatically summarize that when you may not want that. So you need to be careful with those as well. Um, just be aware of that. Now, you can change the way that those aggregate whenever you bring it into PowerView. I'll show you that a little bit later. All right, so I've now done two, really three things. We showed you how many-to-many -many relationships work. We showed you uh, how DAX variables work and DAX comments work. I pointed out I, I'm not, we're not running out of time here, so I'm not going to show there are some new DAX functions as well. You have things like 
um, group by function. You have also uh, date diff is another great function. There's also some like percentile functions that are new as well. There's some good ones out there. You can find some resources on them if you do a quick search. The last thing we're going to talk about, though, is Power View. So let me bring back up my slides for a moment. And then we'll do a lot of Power View to end with the last 20 minutes or so. I brought this up earlier, by the way, but if you've joined late, I am doing live a uh, thing called Periscope. And while it might not be very interesting to watch me do a webinar on Periscope because you're just seeing me talk, uh, I'm also going to be stay staying late on Periscope to do additional questions. So I'm going to try and take as many questions as I can on Periscope. The way you can find where Periscope is at is if you uh, follow, follow me on Twitter. If you go to uh, look for me on Twitter, it's night underscore Devin. That's my Twitter account. And you'll see my last tweet was my, my Periscope little live stream that we're doing. And I'm going to answer some additional questions on there because we got a slew of them and I want to get to as many of them as possible. All right, so let's finish though with the last section here on Power View. So Power View is the data visualization tool. So what you're doing with Power View is you're creating the final report, final thing that you're going to visualize the data in. And um, there are quite a few new visualizations. You have things like uh, area charts that have been added. You have waterfall charts. You have donut charts. You have matrix. You have all kinds of new visualizations and new mapping. If you haven't looked at the designer tool yet, this is new mapping there. And there's a lot of new customizations that people have been begging for with Power View for a long time. So if you've done any kind of Power View perhaps in the past, then um, you probably have realized that Power View for Excel is a little limiting with the customizations that you can do. There's not a whole lot of customizations, unfortunately, uh, but there are uh, inside of Power BI Desktop. Power BI Desktop has some great customizations that you can do. And we're gonna take a look at some of those. In addition to the customizations that are natively built in, you can also import your own custom visualizations, which, which they've announced, but they haven't actually given you the capabilities of doing that yet. Basically, that's the idea of, hey, I have created my own custom visualization, and I can now import it in uh, from what I've developed. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, uh, let's, let's, let's look at what we have here so far. So here's some things that are missing. Uh, if you've played with Power View in Excel before, you probably have really enjoyed things like the play access that you have on scatter charts. There is no play access right now, not yet. Uh, there is no tiling. So if you've done tiles before in the past, there's no tiles here inside of the Power BI desktop. There's also no multiples. So if you've ever done multiples, that's like vertical or horizontal multiples where you can have, uh, for example, multiple maps appear for each region, that sort of thing. And there's no drill. This is one thing that a lot of people are um, not happy about, but I think this will be there very soon. It's just not there yet. Uh, and that drill capability is the idea that I have a map. I want to click on a state and see all the counties within a state, that sort of thing. That's not there yet, but it, um, I, I've kind of been assured that it will be there soon. Okay. All right. Uh, we got a question here. Uh, before you finish, how do you ask a question in Periscope? So uh, in Periscope, there should be a little chat. There's a little chat capability in there where you can ask questions. Um, and uh, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll even take questions that we have inside the uh, GoToMeeting here, and I'll, I'll even bring those over and answer those. And I'll, I'll stay a little bit late in both Periscope and this, but I'll be looking at the screen in Periscope. You do need a Twitter account for Periscope, so if you don't have Twitter, uh, that's the only way they can log in. The session is being recorded. You'll have that available tomorrow. All right, so let's take a look at some Power View stuff here that's new. I'm going to go back over to Power View. Okay, so here's the Power View uh, report that we were looking at earlier that we just had a basic table in it. But what I'd like to do is take this a little bit further. I'd like to make this a little bit more interesting. Right now, we're just looking at a basic table here. Rather than looking at a simple table, let's convert this to something like a combo chart. That would be more interesting. Combo charts you don't have in Excel. This is just in the Power BI desktop. As far as Power View, you can do them in regular Excel. But uh, you have inside of Power View for the desktop, you have things like combo charts that you can do. So I can convert this into a combo chart. Right now, it's just showing as a basic bar. OK. And if I want to add another axis to this, like a, uh, a line value, right now I'm just seeing a column value, I can go find something else. Maybe I want to bring in something like the profit margin. So I can select profit margin here. And I can bring this over to the line values. You can see right now everything is underneath column values. But if I drag this down to line values here, that will now appear here as a combo chart. Okay. So very nice. You can make it as large or small as you want. You can add things like data labels. I'll show you some of those as we go a little bit further through. But um, uh, we're, we're going to kind of do some basics here first, and we'll go more advanced. All right, cool. So we've got a basic chart there. Let's do some other ones. I'm going to create another chart. If you want to create another chart, you just click somewhere in the background. 
And in this new one, let's say that I want to see something basic like just show me the sales amount and I want to see the sales amount by the subcategories of products that we have. So I'm going to grab the sales amount, bring that into my report. You can see that shows up as a bar chart to show start off with. And I'd like to see that based off the different subcategories we have. So I'm going to select that from my field list here on the right hand side. Now, you'll see here at, it initially brings it in as a bar chart, but you have a lot of other options as far as how you want to visualize that. If I want to see it as, for example, a pie chart, you have pie charts in here. I'm not a huge fan of pie charts. I'll talk about that here in a moment. Uh, you can also make that into a donut chart, which is basically a hollowed out pie chart. Uh, you could also do things like funnel charts. You have all sorts of different visualizations up here that you can choose from. So there's a lot more visualizations here than you have inside of Excel and there are a lot more advanced visualizations. They have some more customizations you can do. Okay, now the reason I'm not a fan of pie charts, by the way, is first of all, it's really hard to visualize these little slices that I have in here. Of course, you can hover over and you get a little tool tip that tells you what the data is there. You can also add in data labels now very easily. You'll see underneath the formatting section right here, I can add in things like data labels. If I click that on, it'll actually show me the values. Now, this, the chart's pretty small, so it's not showing it great here, but if I made it a little larger, you'll actually see the uh, dollar amount start to appear there, so you can see those appear. So you can do things like data labels in here very nicely, but the point being, pie charts, pie, char pie charts, and uh, donut charts are really not great at visualizing several different uh, categories, categories of data. It's good if you have maybe two or three categories, Really, one of my favorite new visualizations, and I'm going to show you this anyways, is a tree map. A tree map is a great way to visualize this type of data. So I can select a tree map over here in the switch visualization section here, and I can select the tree map right here. And if I select the tree map, this really visualizes the proportion of the data a lot better. You can certainly add in data labels here as well. So if I want to add in data labels, I would go back to the formatting and turn on the data labels. They actually are already on but you can have great ways of visualizing them inside of a tree map. It's great for proportions of data. All right, let's do another one. Let's look at something like a uh, waterfall. Waterfall is a great new chart that's in here. Let's say, for example, I want to look at something like my sales amount. Again, let's bring sales amount back in. I want to look at sales amount, and I want to see it by year. Okay, so I believe I have a year column in here right here. There we go. Now, I mentioned earlier that year, by default, because it's a number, it's going to try and aggregate. Because right now, what we're seeing is it's summarizing all the years that I have inside the table. Obviously, that does not make sense to do. So if I don't want to summarize years, what I can do is I can come back over here to the value section, and I can change this from, instead of summarizing year, let's actually tell it to not summarize. And uh, the way we can do that, usually there's going to be a do not summarize option here, but because we're in a value section, it has to be a summary of some kind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take year and I'm going to move this over to the axis property here. Okay. And that'll show my chart that looks like this now. Of course, I could have made it the legend as well. So I could have moved it down to the legend section. You can see it appear differently based on the uh, property that you place it in. All right, so I've got this in here right now as a bar chart, but if I want to see it as a waterfall, of course, I can go up to the visualization section here, select waterfall, and it'll convert it to a waterfall chart for me here. It's actually a pretty nice visualization. Of course, I can add in data labels again if you'd like to see the data labels. I actually prefer to see them. I think it looks really nice with them on. And I can see here what the waterfall showing me is kind of the additive value, the total value showing up in red. If I had any negative values, they'd show in, in uh, green here, of course. I'm oh, sorry, uh, red. And then you can have the increaser showing up in as green. So waterfall is a new visualization in here. It's a very nice one. If you want, though, you can certainly change the different types of ways this is being shown. Say, for example, you don't like green showing up as an increase. You can come over here to the formatting section, and you can actually modify some of these things. So if I want to modify some of these things, first of all, I can come underneath the sentiment colors, and I can change what does it mean to be increased. Right now, increase means green, decrease means red, total means this kind of teal color. If I don't like those, I can certainly change those to any other one of the uh, types of colors that you see listed here. You can also select your own custom color. So if you have like a hex color, like an HTML hex value that you want to select, you can do that as well, and you can pick which one you want, hit back, and it's now changed that value into a blue, which you see here on the end. So that's a great new thing with Power View that you couldn't do before. You didn't have that ability to really customize things like you do now. It's great that that's in there because that was one of the biggest requests was, can I change colors? I have this. I have that. I couldn't change the color of uh, road bikes here. I want to change the color of road bike. How do I do that? You can now do that by going underneath the data colors here, and you can actually tell it that I want the road bike 
to be a specific color. Like I showed last time, I can select it that I want it to be orange there, and that'll allow me to do that. You can also still do all the same power view interaction that you've had in the past. I can click on something I have in the tree map, and it'll show up inside the bar chart. I can click on mountain bikes, and it'll filter down my other charts. All that interaction that you've had in the past is still there, and it's still very dependent on you having a well-designed data model. Uh, if you don't have a well-designed data model where relationships exist, a lot of this stuff just does not work. Uh, so a couple other visualizations I want to show you. Some other things you can do in here, things like the card view is a really great new visualization. I like this one a lot. Uh, say, for example, I want to see just a single value on here. I can bring in my profit margin. Okay. Uh, let's take that back. I want to bring in profit margin here as a new visualization. Okay, and I want to see something like the card. You'll see there's a couple different types of cards you can choose from here. This is the card that shows kind of like a single value. You have another type of card, which is like a multi-row card, where you can actually have multiple values appear. I want to just see a single value. I'm just going to select card. It's going to produce that as a single value for me here. So this is kind of like that one metric that I really care about that every time I go to my dashboard, I want to see. That's what this kind of this, this profit margin should appear here for me. So I can see profit margin here showing up as 41%. Uh, you can certainly do some formatting on that as well if you wanted to. I'm going to hold off on that for the time being. But the cool thing about how this works is as I click on different types of values in here, as I click on, uh, let's say, the price, I can see what profit margin is based on someone choosing the product based on the price. Or I can choose something like road bikes, and I can see what the profit margin is for road bikes. My profit margin for road bike bikes is actually lower than, let's say, mountain bikes. Mountain bikes, I have a really high profit margin on, but I'm, I'm not selling as much of them. So this is helping me look at the data and make decisions on it. I can see that one really important value or maybe multiple values. You can have multiple cards there that you can kind of look at. It's a great way to see at a high level how we're doing. All right. So uh, a few other things I want to point out as far as customizations. You can certainly do things like change backgrounds. There's a lot of neat things that they've added. We could spend a lot of time talking about the custom formatting that you can do in here underneath the formatting section. Uh, let me pick a visualization like uh, this, and I can go down to the bottom here, and I can just tell it that I want to format in different ways. Maybe I want to format with a background. You can certainly do that. I want to have a background color of orange or something like that. You can see it appears here. You can change the transparency, a lot of flexibility there. You can even turn it off or on if you want, if you don't want it to be on. Um, one big complaint a lot of people had in the past as well was things like titles, people not liking the title that's given by default here. If you don't like that title, you don't have to keep it now. You can actually modify those titles now. I can come over here to the title section and I can tell it that I want to modify that to show it as subcategory sales or something like that. So you can actually modify those titles in there very nicely. All that is now custom customizable, very easy to work with. So a lot of the things that you've hopefully been looking for in Power BI in the past, you now have. They weren't there before, but they are in the Power BI desktop. All right, so we're running out of time. So let's talk about next steps. The next step on what I would do next is I would take what I've developed and I would publish it off to the Power BI site, my PowerBI.com site. You'll see up at the very top here that you can share and publish this to the Power BI site. There's a button here to do it inside of the Power BI desktop. And you can also publish, they've announced that this is coming, where you can publish as well to uh, Pyramid Analytics. So if you've worked with Pyramid Analytics, which is an on-prem solution, so if someone asked earlier about an on-prem solution, you're going to be able to publish to Pyramid Analytics as well, the Pyramid uh, server. So it's another great way to be able to publish to multiple pub places. There are a lot of partnerships going on right now with Power BI and not just uh, Pyramid Analytics, but also other solutions like other SaaS providers and content packs that are being developed. So there's a lot of neat things that are happening there. But let me show you what happens once I publish. I hit publish to my Power BI site. It's going to save it off to my Power BI site. That's happening right now. Okay, so it's working on publishing it. I do need to sign in. Let me do that real quick. I thought I was already signed in. And once I sign in, that'll publish it off to my Power BI site, and I'll be able to view this from the web, and I could also view it from mobile devices. So mobile devices, you can see this one already exists out here. Let me go ahead and replace it. And uh, what this allows me to do now is to be able to share it with others. It's now shared with others through Power BI. You can now apply security to Power BI. That was some new things that they added through groups. So there's groups. There's also content packs where you can actually share the content that you've developed so other people can build on top of it. Uh, you can also do sharing of the overall desktop. So if you don't want people developing but you want to share and show them a desktop, you can do that as well. So there's a lot of neat things. You need to go to PowerBI.com if you haven't already. A lot of new things that came out in the last couple of weeks. And we'll have more webinars at PragmaticWorks.com that also show these changes. 
Uh, you can see here that I have now published it. If I go to my powerbi.com site, we should be able to see my desktop now appear on my powerbi.com. All right, cool. So let me sign in. All right. And I see there's a ton of questions. Guys, start queuing up your questions inside of the chat. I'll take a few of them here through GoToMeeting. We're out of time here, but I'm going to take a lot of them through Periscope. So I'll do like five minutes of questions through GoToMeeting, and I'll do a ton there. All right, so I just published my report out here. I should see one in here called Completed. Let's see right here. Here's my completed one. And you'll see that once I select that, I should have a report in here as well. Let me find my report. Okay, here it is. So you'll see over on the right-hand side, this has all my fields that are now published off to the Power BI site. And I can start to build more. I can share it with others. There's a lot of cool things that we can do here. All right, so let, let me do this to end off. That's what we do when we're done with development. You can share it. I'm also going to put here on my screen, if you're interested in actually having a little Periscope chat with us here for a few moments, I'm going to take uh, probably quite a few questions there. The way you can find out more about Periscope, is again, this is a social media thing. You can go to my Twitter, which is night underscore Devin, and you can see my last tweet was actually a link to the Periscope that we're doing right now. I'm going to stay on GoToMeeting for a bit to take questions. I want to see it stay on even longer on Periscope to take longer questions. Okay. All right. So let me start. I'm going to go back up to the top of our questions here. I'll do about five minutes of questions in GoToMeeting here. We'll do a ton inside Periscope, and I'm going to talk to the screen in Periscope here now. Um, Oh, so we had questions about our little uh, uh, chat in the beginning. Let me go down to our first set of questions. A lot of people that have not tried Power BI. Okay. Uh, so first question that I'm going to read off here is from Tristan Cook. He said, in Excel, is it possible or was it possible to use a separate table source to provide parameters to a stored procedure called a uh, SQL database? Is there a way to do that in Power BI Desktop? So I think what Tristan's asking here is I showed very early on in our demonstration today how you can actually have data inside of an Excel table and you can parameterize it and you can kick, on, kick it off using macros. Uh, his question is in regards to can you do that same thing against uh, a stored procedure, against a SQL database? The answer is yes, you can. But, um, uh, and you can do that in the Power BI Desktop. The only problem is in Power BI Desktop, you won't be able to do things like uh, I key in a value and then refresh the query like I showed in the very beginning. So that one was reliant on me having an Excel spreadsheet. A user types in some values into the spreadsheet, clicks a macro that kicks off a refresh. Some of those things like the macro aren't possible in Power BI Desktop, but a lot of the other things are. So short, short answer is yes, you can do store procedures that are parameterized in Power BI Desktop, but some of the other macro stuff is not there. Um, so question we have, uh, will the online training such as the analytics with Power BI include PowerBI.com information with the training? So Blake's asking a question about a Pragmatic Works class that we have. This is Blake Smith. We do have a Pragmatic Works uh, analytics with Power BI class where we're going to show both uh, because there are still a lot of things in that class that are um, right now very Excel focused, but we're going to show both Excel and Power BI Desktop because there are still some things you can only do in Excel. And until it's full feature parity, we're going to show both. So if you're interested in like a full class on how to do Power BI, uh, not only Excel, but also this Power BI Desktop tool, uh, go to PragmaticWorks.com under training and you'll find we have a virtual training offering. Uh, by the way, in our virtual training, we also have right now a special where it's going to be 20% off for the next, uh, I think it's through the 20th of August. If Liz, if you're back, correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, so yeah, we have a special on virtual training going on right now. It's a 20% off and uh, we have a Power BI class actually coming up next month. So if you're interested in that, we will spend some time talking about Power BI desktop in that. Uh, next question I see is, um, let's see. Okay. So about refresh here, uh, Ganesh, uh, how, do, how do you refresh data in Power BI desktop from on-premise SQL server? Uh, do we need to configure a personal gateway or uh, data management gateway O data feed should work. Uh, so you can do either. So great question here is, and let me kind of transform your question, Janish, here a little bit, is uh, data management gateway versus personal gateway. Okay, personal gateway is the new thing. Data management gateway has actually been out for a little while now. Uh, the data management gateway is, you can think of as more like your enterprise solution for connecting to on-premise data. Okay, so a lot of people have the question is, how do I get my on-premise data into Power BI? Uh, well, it can be done through the data management gateway, and that'll refresh the data for you, pull the latest in. The data management gateway is more the enterprise way of doing it. The personal gateway is going to, again, think about Power BI is. Power BI is a self-service tool. The personal gateway will use your credentials. So think of yourself as an analyst. 
it will use your credentials as an analyst to access the data that you have permission to, okay? So whereas the, per, the, the uh, gateway, the, the data management gateway, more of an enterprise tool that will have some kind of service account likely that will, it will use to connect to the data, the personal gateway can, can not only connect to things like servers that you have access to on-premise and refresh, it can also connect to uh, files that you have on your desktop. Uh, the big catcher with that is um, you need um, uh, you need to make sure your laptop is on, right? So it's a personal gateway. So it's connected in through your laptop. You need to have your laptop on if you actually wanted to refresh the data source. So that's all about refreshing from on-premise. You can actually choose either. Data management gateway is more of the enterprise. Personal gateway is using your personal credentials. Think of it, again, that's like the self-service way of doing things. Uh, uh, so a question about Power Query here from Mark uh, Chamberlain. Do all the steps in a Power Query get saved? So if you refresh the data, all the transforms are made uh, to the new data automatically. Yes, Mark, that's, that's correct. So this is a question about Power Query. What's happening behind the scenes with Power Query? Let me show you Power Query once more here rather quickly. With Power Query, every time you pull data in, it's keeping those queries saved, and it's actually saving them in the mQuery language. Now, everything I showed you here with the different transformations that we did was very UI-driven, and I clicked on this and I clicked on that to be able to modify the results that we brought in. But you could also do, uh, you can also note that it saves those queries in the mQuery language, and you can find those queries under the advanced editor inside the query editor here inside Power Query. If I click on the advanced editor here, that will actually show me the mQuery behind the scenes. I can take that query, share it with others. Um, I can do a lot with that, and you can actually modify it if you learn a little mQuery. We actually have Pragmatic Works has a Power Query class. If you're interested in that, uh, it's a short, shorter class. It's a two-day class because it's very focused on the one tool. We spend a full day talking about the mQuery language and how you can actually modify it and write your own. So make sure you check that out. That's also on PragmaticWorks.com. Uh, does, uh, so Julie asks here, does a split, so I think she's referring to when I split a column. Julie, this is Julie Evans. Julie Evans asks, uh, does a split warn of truncation? In my scenario, it didn't. There are some scenarios where you might do like a conversion or you convert from a list to a table where it will give you warnings about that. In this case, it did not, it did not give me a warning about that. But what you could do if you want to kind of prepare yourself for that, there are some inquiry functions where you can prepare for errors to happen. So you can actually do some error catching in there if, you, if you're anticipating potential truncation. So there are some things you can do there. All right, so for my uh, GoToMeeting crowd, I'm gonna give you another uh, question and then I'm gonna go all Periscope here for the rest. Uh, so next question I have here is from Irene. So Irene said, is there a limit to the rows uh, that you can pull in for data inside of Power BI? So this is Irene Wu. Uh, so, Irene, the, the limit that you have as far as the amount of data is not so much limited to amount of rows. It's more limited to the resources that you have on your laptop. So uh, the big key to that is what Power Pivot is doing. Uh, Power Pivot is the thing that's storing all the data, and it's an in-memory technology. So the more RAM that you have on your machine, the more RAM that you have on your laptop, 64-bit is very good for that. You need to have 64-bit. Um, the better, because it's going to pull that data into RAM, so it needs to be able to store that. A lot of people don't realize this. This is why 64-bit is so important, is if you have a 32-bit, uh, even if you have a 64-bit operating system, but you have 32-bit Office installed, it's only going to use up to 4 gigs of a RAM. So if you have 8 gigs or 16 gigs of RAM, but you're only, uh, but you're running a 32-bit Office, it's only going to use 4 gigs of that. So 64-bit, you, you would prefer to have. The good news is if you're your desktop team that does all your installations installs 32-bit software, you can you can install the 64-bit the version of the Power BI desktop still, assuming that you still have a 64-bit operating system. All right, so folks that are inside the GoToMeeting, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. You will have the recording out. I'm gonna hang tight on Periscope for some more questions. Again, if you're curious how to get for those more questions, it's uh, you can go to my Twitter, which again, my Twitter is night underscore Devin. I'll pull that up here once more, and I'm we're just out of time, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little experiment here, do a little extra time on Periscope. If you're curious about that, again, here's my Twitter handle right here, Knight underscore Devin. You'll see how to uh, get these extra questions. I'm going to spend probably, there's probably another 20 minutes worth of questions here that I'm going to answer. So uh, again, if you, if you uh, want to hang around for that, you're welcome to. Otherwise, you guys have a great day.